Revelation, the 13th chapter. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like the dragon. The first beast that came out of the water was the medieval church of Rome. From 538 till 1798 when she received the deadly wound. We discovered that another beast comes up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb that would unite together with her in Satan's plan to achieve the allegiance of the world. Protestant America it would rise in time to play a part in the healing of the deadly wound. And this Christian nation exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. The time is coming when we see another worldwide global church. Enforcing a particular brand of worship that was established in the medieval church at Rome so many years ago. And this particular beast coming out of the earth was given power to perform miracles and signs. Verse 14, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth and ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast and to worship the image. Deception is one of the most powerful tools that the devil uses to secure the allegiance of unsuspecting people. In Revelation 16, we get a, another picture of that deception. In chapter 16, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. Look, they are the spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle. So in the midst of all the deceptions and the miracles, we see unclean demon spirits working spiritualistic miracles, deceiving the whole world in the following after the beast. During the time of the Reformation, led by Martin Luther, Juan Diego, 57-year-old Mexican man, reported an apparition, an encounter with Mary, who of course had died almost 2,000 years earlier. And because of his report of seeing Mary, at the same time that millions of people were protesting Rome, leaving Rome, becoming Protestants, to stand on the Scripture and the Scripture alone, over eight million people followed the apparition or the appearance of Mary and became a part of the Church of Rome. Not based on Scripture, but based on the miracle. And I want to suggest to you that the most powerful deception and the most powerful miracle of all is the appearance of someone who is supposed to have died. That's why it's important for us to take some time at Revelation now to understand exactly what does happen when we die. What lies beyond the grave? Is it possible to communicate beyond the grave? We're hearing many stories and reports today of people who have died and apparently gone to heaven and have seen loved ones and then were revived on the operating room table and brought back to life. Is it possible to communicate from beyond the grave? 
There's only one place that we can really trust to find the answer to that question, and that is the Word of God. More specifically, to Jesus Christ. Can you trust Him? Can you trust Jesus to answer that question for you? No matter what answer He gives, can you trust Him? Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, the very first chapter of Revelation, John saw Jesus. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. If anyone knows what's beyond the grave, it has to be Jesus Christ. Amen? Been there, done that, I can tell you all about it. He has done it. He has survived. He has the keys. He has the answer. Turn to Genesis in the second chapter of Genesis on the sixth day of creation. In verse 7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we've seen this already. Creation, sixth day of creation. God formed the body from the dust of the ground, but it was not alive. It was a dead body. He knelt down, breathed into it the breath of life, and that body, the Bible says, became a living being. The King James says it became a living soul. I want you to notice something, that the body became a soul. God did not put a soul into the body. He breathed the breath of life into the body that was not living, and it became a living soul. The soul consists of the body and the breath of life. The soul is something that we are. It is not something that we possess. I do not have a soul. I am a soul. Now, the interesting thing about this, the Hebrew word that's translated here, living being, and in the King James Version, soul, and we need to have a little Hebrew lesson tonight if you really want to understand this topic. The Hebrew word is nephesh. Say it with me. How do you say soul in Hebrew? Nephesh. nephesh. Very good. Now, the reason that's important for you to know is it's used a number of times in the first few chapters of Genesis, the first two chapters of creation story. And one of my favorite places that I like to use to illustrate this point is in chapter 1, verse 30. Watch this. On the sixth day when God made the creatures of the earth. Look, verse 30. And to the beast of the earth and all the birds of the air, and all of the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Now why is that significant? Because the word that's translated creatures, all of the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, the word for creatures is nephesh, soul. The Bible writers could just have easily have translated that verse to read, to all the beasts of the earth, the birds of the air, and all of the souls that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. Because that's what a soul is. It's a living being. The soul is a person. It's not something we possess. It's what we are. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, Abraham left his country and went to the promised land. And the Bible says he took with him all of the souls in his household. He did not go with a bunch of ghosts following him. He went with people. And that's what a soul is, a person. I am a soul. You are a soul. A friend of mine who does the same thing I do. He's a lot bolder than I am. <laughs> and he, he, on the night before this, 
he tells all the people, he says, look, tomorrow night we're going to do something special. In the middle of my presentation, we're going to turn out all the lights, and then we're going to shine a spotlight on the stage, and you are going to see right there a soul. I'm going to show you a soul tomorrow night. So the next night, the whole place is just packed with people. They want to see that soul. And so in the middle of his presentation, he stops, turn all the lights out, spotlight comes down on the center of the stage, and there he is, smiling, big as life. He says, you're looking at a soul. That's what a soul is. You are a soul. The person next to you is a soul. He does not have a soul. She does not have a soul. We do not possess a soul. We are a living soul. Now, that's what the Bible teaches. That may not be what's being taught out there, but we've been learning at Revelation now that what seems right is not always the same as what is right. What is right is what's in here. Amen? We are souls. Now that we understand that, what happens when we die? Well, it's just the opposite, just the reverse of creation. In Ecclesiastes, the little book of Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, the 7th verse, when we die, the dust returns to the ground that it came from. And the Spirit returns to God who gave it. So what happens when we die? The body goes to dust, and the Spirit goes back to God. Now the word Spirit, are you ready for your second Hebrew word tonight? Lesson number two? The word spirit is ruach. I want you to say that with me. The word for spirit in Hebrew is what? Ruach. Okay, very good. Smart group here this evening. So the Bible says the dust returns to the ground it came from and the ruach returns to God. Now ruach is sometimes translated spirit like it is here, sometimes translated breath like the breath of life that God breathed into the body. Sometimes it's translated air or wind or breath in the nostril. So the word ruach, the spirit, the breath of life, the same breath of life that God breathed into the body that made it become a living soul, that breath of life goes back to God and the body goes to dust. Just the reverse of creation. It's important to recognize that something does go back to God. It's my ruach. It's my breath of life or spirit, if you want to call it that. I like to look at it like it's a spark of life that contains everything about me that makes me me. Because when God put that made that body it wasn't alive it was dead but he breathed into it that spark of life and it became a man with character and personality and that spark of life goes back to God the body goes to dust now that spark of life or breath ruach that goes back to God is not the person. It's the life that animates that person. But it's not the person because Jesus said in, in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Marvel not, for the time is coming when all who are in the grave will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So according to Jesus, all are where? In the grave. My life, my breath of life goes back to God. But the person is in the grave. That Ruach is not the person. It's not me. Jesus said we're in the grave. Both the good and the bad. The good awaiting the resurrection of life. And the bad awaiting the resurrection of damnation, but they are the person according to Jesus in the grave. Do you believe him? Yes. Folks, we have to believe him. If we can't, then who can we believe? So my breath goes back to God, my body goes to dust. Where are the dead? According to Jesus, all are in the grave. Now, 
I'm going to stop here for a second because what you have just heard is not the same thing as what most of us have been taught and believed for years and years. That when we die, if we've been good, we go to heaven. We've been bad, but we don't talk about where we go. Isn't that right? Isn't that what most people are taught? But that's not what Jesus said. It is dangerous to study the Bible with preconceived ideas of the way things have to be. It's much better to pretend you know nothing and let God speak to you and tell it how it is. Because when we have preconceived ideas, we tend to overlook things that contradict what we believe and look for things that support it. I know human nature. So let's do this. Let's get our computers out, bring up your word processor, and click new document. What's on the screen? Blank page. Blank page, right? So let's start with a blank page and let God tell us what is true and what is not. Are we safe or not? Amen? Amen. Okay, second rule. I can take a verse from the Bible and take it out of context and make it say anything I want it to say practically. And a lot of people do that. It's like fence posts. You've seen fence posts all lined up nice and perfect in a line. Well, let's suppose I have one fence post right here. And I step back and I can line up that fence post so it's right at the double doors in the back. But if I stepped over here, it's pointing at that single door over there in the back. If I step over here, that same fence post is pointing at the single door back there. And if I were to step back there, then it would be pointing at that flower pot on the wall behind me. You see, it depends on where I'm standing. It depends on my point of view as to where it's pointing. And that's the way the Bible is. You can take one text, make it say almost anything. If you take them out of context, the Bible says Judas went and hung himself. And then another place it says, now you go do likewise. You see what happens when you ignore the context? So if we take another fence post and put it in front of our first one and then another one and another one and a few more and step back, then all of those fence posts are all pointing in the, one, in the same direction. And if I take all the texts that are talking about the same topic, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and I line them up, then they're all pointing in the same direction. And that's to the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. So let's start with a blank page on our word processors and let's line up some fence posts and see what the Bible has to say. So far, the body goes to dust, breath of life back to God. Jesus said, all are in the grave. So what are they doing there in the grave? Psalm 100, chapter 46, another fence post. Let's line them up. Verse 4, when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. Same thing we just read so far. On that very day, their thoughts perish. So when a man dies, what happens to his thoughts? They perish. So tell me this. If a man dies, can he think? No, why not? Because his thoughts perish. See, it's perfectly in line with our fence post. Body goes to dust, breath of life back to God. The dead are in the grave. They can't think. So that's not the person that goes to God. It's not a conscious awareness. There's nothing there that can communicate from beyond the grave. There's no possibility of Mary appearing to you or to anyone else trying to tell them a message from God because her thoughts perished. Are you beginning to see why this is important? Here's another one, Psalm 115. Another fence post, verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down to silence. Question. Think about it. If a Christian dies, 
Does he praise God? What does the Bible say? The dead do not praise the Lord. Why not? Because their thoughts perish. They can't think. So they can't even praise God because they're not aware of God or anything going on. They are in the grave. Breath of life goes back to God. It's in the hand of Jesus. He's hanging on to it for me. And one of these days, he's going to put it back into a new body. Not yet. But until then, no thinking. In fact, watch this one. I say the best one in, here in this particular sequence till last. This is in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. When a person dies, does he know anything? Why not? Because his thoughts perish. Can he praise God? Nope. Why not? Because he can't think. His thoughts perish. There are no thoughts in the grave. Watch this, verse 6. Their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Can he love you? No. Because he can't think. His thoughts perish. Verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. For in the grave where you are going. So where does the person go? To the grave. In the grave where you are going, there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. All of our texts are lined up like a fence post pointing in the exact same direction. There is no conscious awareness of anything happening in the grave. I was reading this verse, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. First time I read the Bible through after I got saved, it happened to be a living Bible. I didn't know that that was just a paraphrase, not a real translation. But that's all right. I was reading it, and God was blessing me. But I came to that verse, and it said, verse 5, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And I noticed there's a footnote there. And I said to myself, hmm, I wonder what that footnote says. So I looked down at the bottom of the page and I read it and I just dropped my jaw open. Couldn't believe it. Do you want to know what it said? No? Well, I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> it said this, these words are Solomon's own discouraged opinion and does not reflect God's truth on this subject. I read that again and I said, what? That's just Solomon's discouraged opinion. What's it doing in the Bible? I thought the Bible was the Word of God. Now listen to me. Some of you may be struggling with the verses I'm reading right now. And you may be going, whoa, man, this is not what I've always believed. So when we read a verse like this, the dead know nothing, their thoughts perish, we have to make a decision, just like whoever wrote the Living Bible had to make a decision. We can say, well, that's not the way I understand it. I better change the way I understand things to line up with the Scripture. Or we can say, well, that must not have come from God. It disagrees with me, so I'm going to tear that page out. That didn't come from God. But before you start tearing pages out of your Bible, you have to be prepared to answer another question. How do you know which ones to leave in? Can a human being decide, is this the word of God or not? Folks, this is the same Bible Jesus had when he was here. The same Old Testament. And it didn't bother him. So we should embrace it too. Amen? Amen. This is the Bible from Genesis Revelation, or it's not. The living know they will die the dead know nothing. Let me show you how Jesus looked at it. We can trust him. Remember that? We agreed at the beginning. Jesus, tell us, what's it like when we die? Jesus has been working with his disciples, and some people came up to him, said, your friend Lazarus in Bethany is about to die. He's sick. And so on the way to Bethany, Jesus said in John 11, 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going to go there to wake him up. And the disciples said, well, Jesus, if, if he's sleeping, then he's going to get better. Verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant 
natural sleep. And so Jesus told them plainly in verse 14, no, Lazarus is dead. Why did Jesus say that Lazarus was asleep? Because that's the best word to describe what happens when we die. The body goes to dust. The breath of life goes back to God. Thoughts perish. It's like a deep, comfortable, warm, cozy sleep. That's the best description that Jesus could come up with. He liked it. Why shouldn't we? Lazarus is asleep. I like that picture of what it's like when we die. Some people tell me, well, I don't like that, preacher. Sounds cold to me. Well, I don't know about them, but I sleep in a warm bed. <laughs> and it's warm and comfortable and cozy. And it feels good. And I like to sleep. <laughs> and when I'm asleep, I'm not aware of anything going on. My, our oldest son, when, when we would, when they were little and they traveled with us, Dina would always have them sit in the front row. And when she finished singing, she would take them in the back and had a couple of cots back there and they would go to sleep. After the meeting, we'd go pick them up, put them in the car, drive home, put them in their bed. One morning, our oldest boy woke up, and he said, Mama, why am I always waking up somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what it's like. The body goes to dust. Breath of life back to God. We're asleep. And we wake up somewhere else. Jesus got to the tomb and he saw the two sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. They were crying in the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Even though he knew what he was about to do, that's how compassionate he is. And so then he told them, he said, roll away the stone. Oh, no, don't do that. He's been dead four days. The odor will offend people. Jesus said, roll away the stone. So they rolled it away. And then Jesus stepped forward, and he looked inside the tomb. And he said, Lazarus, come out. And they heard a rustling sound inside, and they saw Lazarus coming out. There is life after death, but only at the voice of the life giver. Jesus Christ through the resurrection of life. Notice something else. Jesus didn't go looking in that tomb and say, Lazarus, you've been burning down there long enough. Come on up. <laughs> Is that what he said? No. He didn't go looking in that tomb and say, Lazarus, You've been up there in heaven long enough. Come on down. I don't want to come down. Too bad. Come on down. <laughs> that would have been a dirty trick, huh? I mean, who wants to come back here after being up there? No. Nope. He looked into the tomb, and he spoke to a friend that was asleep in the grave, and he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. Life after death at the resurrection by the words of Jesus Christ. Wow. What a precious hope we have. 
Now, I want you to understand, for those of you that are a little uneasy with what you're hearing, in one sense, one sense, what I'm saying is not a lot different from what we've all believed for a long time. That is that when we die, we go up, we've been good, when we've been bad. Not a lot different from the point of view of the person who dies. Because when they die, they're asleep. They don't know anything. They're not aware of any passing of time. It's like my son. They just wake up somewhere else. When the person that dies, from their point of view, in one sense, it's almost like dying and instantly being raised again to go and to be with Jesus. So from that sense, there's not a lot of difference. But the difference is for those of us who are left behind. Because if we believe that the dead are not dead, but living somewhere else, up or down, then there's always the possibility of being deceived by the appearance of someone supposedly to have been dead. And the devil can impersonate the dead just as much as he can impersonate an angel of light. And that explains the apparitions that you see. What a powerful deception. A lady lost her little girl, three years old. After the funeral, she was home just lying on her bed, not wanting to do much of anything when she heard a sound, a door open. And there was her little girl standing in the center of the floor, arms outstretched, same yellow dress she was buried in, a twinkle in her eyes, saying, Mommy, Mommy, I'm back. She said everything inside of her wanted to race over there and embrace her little girl. And it took every ounce of faith that she could muster to say, You are not my daughter. Get out of here. And instantly she turned into a hideous-looking monster and vanishing away into the darkness. The supposed appearance of those who have died is the most powerful deception the devil can conjure up. That's why we need to stand on the solid word of God. How long do they stay, or we stay, should we sleep before he comes? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is one of the favorite texts, favorite funeral texts. Verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep. Notice Paul likes to use the exact same words Jesus did. Well, I mean, why not? Jesus picks the best words. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, he says, in the twinkling of an eye, when? At the last trumpet. Because the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? When? At the last trumpet. Not when we die. But when Jesus comes and the trumpet sounds, then the dead will be raised imperishable. Up until that time, they are perishable. And we will be changed, and this mortal man will put on immortality. Mortal means that we are subject to die. Not that we go on living after we die, but we die. Immortal means we will no longer be subject to death, but we will not be immortal until the last trumpet sounds. How can God say it any clearer than he has? But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, Verse 7, we live by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, we're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body or at home with the Lord. Or as 
King James says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, it sounds like he's saying that when we depart the body, we go to be with Jesus. In a sense, that's true. When we die, our breath goes back to God. And it's in the hand of Christ. Our life is hid in Christ. And when he shall appear, we too shall appear. That's clear. But that's not what Paul is speaking about right here. We have a fence post. It looks like it's out of line. And when you get a fence post out of line, it's best to go back and look at it in its context. So let's do that. Chapter 5, verse 1. We know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now, what is the earthly tent that he's talking about? This body that you're looking at right now, the perishable body, subject to decay, subject to disease, this is my earthly tent. If it's destroyed, I have a new heavenly tent. Where is that one? What is it? My new heavenly body that Jesus gives me after this old world is done and he raises me up to be in heaven or changes me to be imperishable and immortal. My new body that will not see decay, it will not die, it will not perish, it will not do anything bad. So what is Paul saying? We have two bodies. One that we're living in right now, earthly tent. Oh, but I don't want to be in that one. I want to be in my heavenly tent. Don't you? Watch this. Verse 2. Meanwhile, what is meanwhile between the earthly and the heavenly? Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So what does he want? He wants to have his new body. I can understand that in every day and every year that goes by, I understand it better and better. And every morning when I have to crawl out of bed and the old creaks and the aches and the pains, I think, man, hurry up, Jesus. I want my new body. It won't ever ache anymore. No more eyeglasses, no more hearing aids, no more feet hurting. You want that body? So no wonder Paul is groaning, longing to be clothed with his heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we'll not be found naked. Now watch this. He's in his earthly body groaning to be clothed with his heavenly body so that he won't be naked. Does he want to be without a body? No. Does he want to die and go to heaven without a body? That's not what he's saying. What does he want? He wants to have his new body. He says, while we're in this tent, we groan and we're burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed but to be clothed with our heavenly. I don't want to be without a body. I don't want to die and go to heaven without a body. That's not what I'm asking for. No, I want to be in my new heavenly body so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Therefore now, as long as we're at home in this body, we're away from the Lord. I'm in my earthly body. I'm not there with God. We live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, what is he saying? Do I want to be out of this body and without a body at home naked with God? No. He wants to be out of this body because when he gets out of this body, the next thing he knows, he'll be in his new body with Jesus at the last trumpet. And all of our fence posts line up. They all line up. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite texts. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, verse 13, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. So he's wanting us to understand what happens when people fall asleep, right? What was the problem at Thessalonica? People were teaching... And you'll see in a second, there were false teachers there teaching that when you die, it's all over. They're done. And you'll never see them again. And there's no hope for them to go to heaven. They're finished. Wow. What would that do to our Christian faith? We have a hope, don't we? We have a hope far greater than that. So Paul says, I don't want you to grieve like the rest of men about those who have fallen asleep have no hope i don't want you to be like that 
Verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So they're not done. They're not finished. Jesus died. He rose again. And he's going to come and bring them with him back to heaven. That's what he's talking about. How do I know that? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, according to the Lord's own words, can we trust him? According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left, until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. We are not going to heaven before those who die. Don't let anybody tell you that. They're going to be there. We're not going before those who have fallen asleep. See, he uses that same word again. Why not? Verse 16, here it comes. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God. Sounds like a lot of commotion going on when Jesus comes. Amen. And the dead in Christ, Christians who have died, will rise first. Amen. From where? From the grave, where they've been sleeping all this time. So when Jesus comes for us, they're going to rise first. And then, after that, verse 17, we who are still alive and left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Amen. All our fence posts line up. Jesus is going to bring them with him to heaven, those who sleep in Christ. How? When he comes with a loud command, trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise up. Hey, you know what I've often thought? Wouldn't it be neat to be near a cemetery when Jesus comes? <laughs> Watch those graves open up and the saints come out. Wouldn't you love to see an angel fly down to a little hole in the ground bend over and take out a little baby and fly up to the mother and put that baby in her arms. Do we have hope or not? I don't want you to be ignorant like the rest of the men. The Lord is going to come with a loud command, a trumpet call. The dead in Christ are going to rise and we're going to be caught up to meet him in the clouds, and so we will be with the Lord forever? Doesn't it make more sense? I think it does. The word and so, the Greek word hutas, it means in this way, in this manner. This is how we're going to go to be with the Lord. How? At a loud command, trumpet call of God, the dead are raised up, and us together with them are going to go. Hey, tell me something. When you do something fun, maybe you watch the movie, or maybe you, you go skiing, or maybe you go hiking to your favorite spot up in the mountains or out by the coast. Tell me, is it more fun to go all by yourself or to enjoy it with other people that you love? Now, the greatest event and the most fun event in the history of the whole universe is going to happen when Jesus comes. He's going to take us. And all together, we're going to be caught up to meet him. And he's going to take us to that place that he's prepared for us. And all together, we're going to walk through the gates of that city and see the Lamb and the throne and walk the streets of gold together. Not one at a time, all by yourself, here, there, whenever you die. But we're asleep. And then the next thing we know, the voice of Jesus is calling us. And together we walk through the gates, encourage each other with these words. That's encouraging to me. Makes more sense to me. Jesus said, John 6, verse 40, He who believes in me has everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day 
Now, the moment you accept Jesus Christ, at that moment you have life, but that life is hid in Christ. And when He appears, we appear with Him. We have everlasting life. But how can Jesus raise Him up on the last day if He is already up there with Jesus? Dude, that never made sense to me. And I'll tell you something else that used to bother me. Did you ever go to a funeral and the pastor reads this verse? The Lord himself will descend with a loud command, trumpet call, and the dead in Christ will rise. Have you ever heard that at a funeral? They always use it. So you go to a funeral, and the pastor usually says something like, My dear brothers and sisters, we're here to pay our last respects to our dear brother who is now in heaven with Jesus. So why is everybody so sad? <laughs> no more backaches? No more pain? No more heartaches? <laughs> why is everybody so sad? Sure, we miss him. Sure we do. He's now in heaven with Jesus. And then he reads this verse. According to the Lord's own words, loud command, trumpet call of God, and our brother in Christ is going to rise up. How can he rise up if he's already there? It never made sense to me. And there's something even worse about this. How many of you believe that every church member, everyone who has their names on the church books, when they die, they all go to heaven? Does anybody believe that? Of course not. We're not saved because we belong to a church. No matter what church it is, we're saved because we believe in Jesus Christ our Lord. But have you ever been to a funeral and the pastor says, well, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm so sorry to say to you that our brother is now <laughs> down there. Have you ever heard that? Of course not. Where does every church member go when they die? To heaven. But you and I know that that's not true. So who is getting duped? And furthermore, how does the pastor know? He's not the judge. He's not God. How does he know? I know that I have eternal life because I know I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, but you don't know that. I could be the biggest phony you ever saw, but God would know. But no man would ever know. No pastor would ever know. How does he know who's saved and who's lost? Isn't it better to just leave them in Jesus' hands and leave that up to God? Amen. They're asleep. We have hope. Two years ago, we were doing a revelation now in Anchorage, Alaska, and it was being filmed for television. And I'll never forget, it was the same day that I was getting ready to do this same presentation. We were staying in a little apartment just across the street, across the parking lot from the church. And my mom had been sick. She had lung cancer. And I was on the way over to the church, and my phone rang. I took it out of my pocket. It was my sister. She said, Jack, I don't think she's going to make it through the night. What do you want to do? I couldn't leave. You had the film crew. They flew all the way up to Anchorage. And I knew she wouldn't want me to leave. She loved Jesus and wanted people to hear about Jesus. But I was torn. She said, you want to talk to her? I said, let me talk to her. Her voice was really weak. Could barely make out the words, but I knew what she said because it was the same thing she said every time I talked to her on the phone. She had a little dementia, and you know what it's like, the same thing over and over. So I picked up the phone, and I said, Mom, and she said something 
barely able to understand it, but it was Jack. When am I going to see you again? She said that every time. And I said, Mom, won't be long. And she passed away that night. One of these days, Jesus is going to come. And I believe, and it's all right to believe that. We don't know, but we can believe. I believe. She's going to come up out of that grave. And I'm going to walk over there. I'm going to take her hand. I'm going to say, Mom, I told you it wouldn't be long. Let's go see Jesus. What a hope. What a hope we have in Jesus Christ. It makes more sense, doesn't it? To believe what Jesus said. I know what some of you are thinking, but pastor, what about the thief on the cross? He died and Jesus told him that day that he would be in heaven. Uh-oh, now we have a fence post out of line. So what are we going to do about that? You know the story in Luke, the 23rd chapter, verse 42. Jesus said, Remember me to the thief. The thief said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today. You will be with me in paradise. So that isn't what it says. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, if Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise, we have a fence post out of line. If he said, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise, then all the fence posts line up again. See, it depends on when Jesus took a breath. I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Or I tell you the truth today. You will be with me in paradise. So when did he breathe? You see, that's the question. He said, well, the comma's not there. The comma says, I tell you the truth today. Today, I tell you the truth today. You'll be with me in paradise. But there were no commas when the Bible was written. It wasn't written in English. It wasn't written in King James. It was written in Greek. And they didn't even separate verses and chapters. They didn't even separate sentences. They didn't even separate words. You had to know where one word ended and the next word began. Paper was scarce. They jammed it all together. And they put the commas in there a year, just a few hundred years ago. Not when the Bible was written. They put it in the wrong place. How can I be so sure? Because it's out of line with the rest of the fence posts. Number one. And number two, even worse, Jesus himself did not go to heaven that day. Well, how do I know that? You know the story. Mary and Martha, Sunday morning, went running to the tomb, and they found it empty. And they were all discouraged. Oh, what happened? So they were going back all discouraged, and they encountered Jesus. And so Mary went running to Jesus. You remember the story? With her arms outstretched to embrace him, and Jesus said, don't touch me. Why not? Because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Sunday morning, and he had not yet ascended to the Father? So how could he have told the thief on Friday I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise because he didn't get there yet by Sunday morning. Nope. They put the comma in the wrong place and the fence post is out of line. But when we put the comma in the right place, the thief is hanging on the cross and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. 
Napoleon's armies were sweeping across Europe. Looked like nothing was going to stop him. When the English sent their ships with Lord Wellington down to Waterloo to fight against Napoleon. This was before the days of CNN and embedded reporters. So no one in England knew what was happening. If Wellington lost and Napoleon won, then England was history. It was their last chance. So they're looking and waiting and watching, and finally they see the ships coming down the English Channel. And they're wondering what happened. They turn their glasses on to the ships, and there's a man standing on the bow of the lead ship, and he's sending a message with the flags and semaphore. W, E, L, L, Wellington, D, E, D -d defeated. And just then a dense cloud bank settled in on the English Channel. And the message was over. Wellington defeated. All hope was gone. There was nothing to look forward to anymore. But the cloud bank lifted. And the message came again. Wellington defeated. Napoleon and the gloom turned into rejoicing. And so it was on that Friday evening when they took the body of Jesus down from the cross and buried it in the tomb, sealing it so he couldn't get out. The message came loud and clear. Jesus Christ defeated. The disciples had fled Peter with his last words to Jesus still ringing in his ear, I don't know that cursed man. All hope was lost. Until Sunday morning when the cloud and the fog lifted and the tomb was empty and the message came again. Jesus Christ defeated death. And he's alive. He's alive.